since I was 12, so for real. Wrote my first compiler when I was 15. Uh, 30 years doing distributed computation, 25 years writing OS's, <laughs> device risers, high performance computing stuff. Eventually, I did the compiler that ended up inside of the hotspot Java virtual machine, which made Java go fast, which taught the world that you could generate high quality code inside and on the fly. Uh, uh, you know, it, and I did this in the face of everyone on the planet saying, no, you cannot do this, it just won't work. Uh, and then tons and tons of stuff after that. So, so okay, but just want to ask you if you're all okay. Uh, more or less. I'm losing my voice because I have a cold, and so I'm going to run out when I run out. All right. <laughs> anything you need? All right. I'm sorry. Anything you need? No, I think I'm good. Okay, great. Enjoy the class. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So that's enough of who I am. Um, although I've been working the last four years on this project called H2O, which is a big platform, a platform for doing big data and machine learning. Mostly, it's a platform for doing big math. Math at scale. And then from there, you can build machine learning, do lots of other stuff with it. Um, and I'll give you my other caveat before I flip slides here. So I'm a, I'm a tool builder, sort of the ultimate you know, language implementer, tool maker in software. My math and stats background, my formal math and stats background is very light, as is anything to do with machine learning other than what I've picked up in the last four years. So I'm going to go on a, on, a, on a journey of exploration, touching lots of topics lightly in a big circle, because this is what data science is about, what machine learning is about. There's going to be some amount of operating systems, OS level distributed computation that you're going to have to pick up and learn. You're going to look at a cluster of computers to try to solve a big problem. Okay. There's going to be some math and stats you're going to have to know. And, and this is going to be like what algorithms work and when they don't and why and what are the issues with using them to solve a real problem. There's going to be some domain specific knowledge and the domain will vary a lot between how you apply it. But there's some real world thinking that has to go on here. It's not sort of abstract, but you have to apply your gut instinct and your knowledge of how the world works to make something happen. And the goal then is to solve a real problem using data to, you know, to make the world a better place. And, I, and I'll step you through some examples. Okay, so I'm going to start with the Titanic. It's, uh, uh, it's really, I'm looking for a story in the data. And along the way, I'll talk about finding a story in the data you know, over and over again. The real idea here is that somehow there's some information buried in a pile of data that you can use, you can extract, and, and change the world with. In this case, there was this enormous tragedy. A huge number of people died. And what can we learn from the data? And in particular, I picked this data set because it's widely available. Here's a URL. I'll have the slides available later. If you just Google Titanic passenger list data set, this will pop right up, along with another ton of varieties of it. So it's, it's widely studied and available. And we're going to take a look at why you lived or died in the heat of the moment when the tragedy was unfolding. 
But first, we're going to back up a second and take a look at what it means to do data science. Um, and, and there's a bunch of different pieces and parts in flight here. And so as part of understanding, like all of it, later in the semester, I'm going to ask people to group in groups of like two to four people. And I strongly encourage you to pick a partner who knows something that you don't. Because this class has got like one quarter of comp site people who probably are fairly weak on stats and math and a small number of math and stats people who are probably fairly weak on the physical sciences and a fair number of people who are in the physical sciences who might not have these other parts well figured out, including some business people who are doing you know, economics or whatever. And these all are, have a useful, you know, useful applications of machine learning. Find a partner who knows something that you don't or you'll end up being you know, heavy on one side and light on the other and you'll stumble on one piece of the other. Okay. So what do we do? To, what does it mean to do some data science? So this is basics here, right? You're going to load some data. Um, typically, that fails the first few times because the data is messy, and you're going to have to clean it up just to get it into any kind of tooling whatsoever. So this is a time when you'll be looking at the data with like text editors, VI, Emacs, Grep, Last More, that kind of stuff, Unix utilities, staring at small chunks of a giant data set to figure out what it looks like. Then once you get it loaded, you might try to build a model, a mathematical model, a representation of reality, some sort of estimate that says I can look at some piece of the data and make a prediction. And then when you look at the model that you've built, you'll discover that it's typically it's crap, at least on the first few passes. It's going to underfit or overfit really badly, and I'll talk people through what that means. And for people who are like in, in the machine learning space or have the you know, math and stats uh, already, you know what underfit and overfit means. And if you're coming from a different direction, like CompSci, maybe it's not quite so obvious what that means. So then you go tear into it. You're going to you know, look for new features and toss out old ones that, you know, that don't make sense and iterate uh, around and around and around until you get a model that looks like it's doing something useful. And really the goal is to get a model that you can take to the market and make some money with, maybe save lives, you're going to find cancer, you're going to predict credit card fraud, you're going to find when you know, AT&T uses this kind of stuff to know when their trucks fail or are going to fail in the field. They have 100,000 trucks. They send out every day to go solve problems, fix people's stuff in their homes, to repair broken lines. Some fraction of those trucks die, then they have two problems. The original one and a crew stuck in the field with a dead truck. So they predict truck failure and they bring the truck in for uh, shop maintenance ahead of time instead of after they discover that it's blowing some part in the field. So this is the Titanic data set, at least the first like five or six lines. Um, it's kind of a messy comma separated value. Why am I saying this? Because like 50 to 80% of the data sets you start with will come out in a CSV format or have a CSV option. So you have to know what they look like and what it means. In this case, it's got some 1,300 rows and 14 columns. Sometimes these data sets will have tabs instead of commas separating fields. Sometimes vertical pipes. Sometimes spaces. Sometimes other weird characters like you're a hive file coming out of a Hadoop cluster. Um, you can get really strange looking stuff in there. The first line often contains a title, but not always. Sometimes it does not. Sometimes it has lots of title lines. Sometimes you have to filter them because your tool you're using doesn't know how to separate title from data. Um, often the title lines do not include titles for all columns. Sometimes you have more columns than you have titles, and so if you just say, hey, I got 14 columns because I got 14 names in my title line, you're wrong. So you have to actually look at all of it as you go. There are spaces in this file in fields between the commas. In fact, there's multiple spaces. That's kind of common. You might find tabs. You might find other kind of junk characters in there. For instance, weird things like closed parens, slashes, which sometimes are used to escape other characters in your CSV and sometimes are actually a slash. You might have single quotes or double quotes, which sometimes are used to quote fields and sometimes are just part of a name. So you can't just like import this data and say, hey, go. You have to like look at it, figure out what it is you're reading. And that will be very common as you look at data sets. Sometimes they're really clean, and that means somebody spent a lot of work cleaning it up. Usually they're messy like this, and your job is going to be to clean it up. Here between pairs of commas, I've got no data. And that's another common thing. It means you don't have a value. It's a missing value. And that plays a big role in the math. For instance, if I'm looking at computing the average age here, and I have some missing ages, say I have only 1,200 ages instead of 1,300 passenger ages, 
Then I'm going to do my math. The average age will be divided by 1,200. You know, add them up, divide by 1,200. It won't be divided by 1,300. And, and that changes all throughout the different math you end up doing. So, you know, shorthand, I'm going to use NA, not available. That's kind of common. Um, but sometimes people have other indicators for missing values. Sometimes I use a question mark. Sometimes it's a dash. Sometimes it's some other kind of special character. NA is a common one from the uh, R language community, but it's not the only one. This data has categorical values. There are plenty of chairs, by the way, in the middle and the front. This data has categoricals, or sometimes called factors, where the individual values of male and female might be called levels, or an enumeration if you're looking at a, a sort of a standard programming language. And that's a real common thing as well. You might like to think of it and print it as a string, but it's really it's a two-value variable. It's true or false. It's one or the other. But maybe it has lots of values. And zip codes might be you know 10,000 or 100,000 zip codes. Maybe it's the car manufacturers. It's Ford, Chrysler, Mercedes, Benz, you know Beamer, whatever hell. So it might be two dozen car manufacturers or, or lots and lots of others. So so categoricals are are happen a lot, and they are discreetly different things. Each individual one, as opposed to age, which is continuous value. So if I'm predicting on age, I might get a number from 1 to 99, and I might have all kinds of fractional things. But if I'm predicting a categorical, I'm going to get one or the other, and not a fraction in between. All right, so here's age, which at first glance looks like it might be an integer, but it turns out there's some kids, some babies, who have fractional ages. Just messes with how you pull the data in. You look at. And of course, there's some missing ages there as well. And then in this case, um, there's a, a, a survived column here, which is what I'm going to use as my predictor. So the predictor in this case happens to come up as 0 and 1, you lived, you died. So that's good. Often it will be 1 or minus 1, or true, false, or x and a missing value, or any number of other representations. Sometimes the thing you're going to be predicted on has been peeled out of the file and moved somewhere else and you have to like join two files together to train and keep them apart if you're going to test your results. So these things come in a lot of shapes and maybe I'm going to predict on age later and then you know it'll be a different different kind of thing there. Um, and notice actually also that survived is 0 and 1 so that when I pull the data in it's going to come in as a real number value. It happens to have only the value 0 and 1. But I really want to treat it like it's a, a, a factor or categorical, right? It's true or false. It's, it's one or the other. You can't have 0.5, you have to. <coughs> There, there are seats in the middle and the front here. Okay. So I'm going to step you through a little workflow and then I'll do a demo uh, and then we'll go back around to, to, uh, uh, to slides again. So this kind of normal workflow here is you're going to have some sort of IDE working environment that you like. Um, I'm going to use H2O because this talks on big data and that's what I'm going to use for my big data. And I'm going to use a web browser because it's easy to demo live in front of an audience. But you probably end up wanting a scripting language like R or Python. And there are a number of other tools available, but R and Python are sort of the most popular scripting tools for doing machine learning. And they have a wide variety of you know, libraries and tools available within them to do machine learning tasks. I'm going to load this data set. I'm going to explore it a little bit. And then I'm going to try to build a model. And I'm going to suddenly discover I've overfit really badly. And we'll come and talk about that. But basically, we'll discover something like, oh, if you got a bad number in your data, you lived, because you got on a lifeboat. And if you didn't get on a lifeboat, you didn't live. So let's do a little, a little, uh, a little look at getting my IDE up. I'm going to launch H2O as a, as a jar file. I'm going to pull up my GUI here. If I can get the right one, try this one. There we go. OK. So I ended up poking at a cluster that I've built. I'll take one quick look at it, and then I'm going to go back to doing machine learning here. This web interface is like uh, a notebook style, IPython, notebook, Jupyter, that kind of uh, thing. I have individual cells that are actionable I can edit. In this case, I started a cluster of one node, because it's my laptop here, and it's got memory of, uh, not memory bandwidth here, where's my, where's my memory here? 7.12. Memory, yeah, okay. No, that's the bandwidth. There's actually a, a total memory consumption probably off the side because I've got my slide, because I have my resolution here. Uh, somewhere out here I've got two and a half gigs of memory because I took a default configuration and didn't ask for anything more. Fine. Um, 
with a data set of, of the size I'm looking at here, it hardly matters what machine I use. But as the data gets bigger, you'll start having more and more issues until the laptop won't do it anymore. And then you want a bigger machine or a cluster of machines. And the data sets, in, it, eventually I'm hoping that we'll be able to get the class on the data sets that are looking at the hundreds of gigabytes to terabyte range. But that'll depend on get Amazon worked after. Okay. So I'm all happy that I have a cluster. I'm going to pull a file in. Um, in this case, the file is just local inside of uh, H2O here. Um, this is the same Titanic data set. Here, this guy. That, I, uh, that I'm showing here. And all I'm doing here is indicating with a script line that I want to find this file. And I asked for a parse. And the first thing parse does is it does a setup run. It shows me a bunch of things here. So I'll show you a lot of options here. It's a comma separated file, but I can choose. Its first row contains uh, headers or not. Uh, single quotes or quotation characters or not. And there's a lot of options because CSV files are messy and everyone does it differently. And here's my prediction of what I should parse this file as. Names will come out as a string, survive is going to be a number, sex is an enumeration because it has a couple different flavors and so on and so forth. I'll go ahead and do that and of course this will take no time at all and it's done and I'll look at the data. And this is a, a high level overview. I have 1309 rows, 14 columns, and then here's individual columns. I could poke at them real quickly here. For instance, the survived will give me a ratio of two-thirds dead, one-third lived, roughly speaking. That's a you know, distribution of live and die. Um, maybe I'm going to look at your ages. Um, I get a distribution like this. So one of the things I'm doing here is when I'm exploring the data is I'm trying to figure out that my data is sane. Like if the ages showed something bizarre, I'd have to go ask the question like what the hell's going on with the data? Is this actual real? These numbers look sensible. There are some old folks but there's some, yeah, most people are middle-aged. I think that's, that sounds reasonable. Um, suppose I look at the, the ticket fare, and I can see some numbers out here. Somebody paid five or 600 bucks for first class upgraded cabin, or pounds in 1912, right? A whole lot of people paid zero. Well, that tells me there's something going on there that doesn't make sense. We have to think about that. Now, I know the average ticket fare for a third class passenger is like seven pounds or eight pounds, something like that. Um, but people have traveled in family groups, and so maybe the father paid, you know, for four people and paid 30 or 40 pounds, and then everyone else got a zero. I don't know. But there's something going on with the fair price that it's not straight up legit to take it as it is. I'll have to think about it at some point. But that's just a you know, warning flag. And, and you sort through the data here to, to kind of figure out that you believe it or not. In this case, I'm going to take it as is. I'm going to hit my build model button, and if you're running this from R Python, you'll have a script that would say, hey, go build a model. Because the first thing you want to do is try to like try something out and see what you get, and the expectation here will be, you know, something will happen, and did it crash, and did it work, and did I get a model out that makes sense, and probably not, and we'll have to investigate. I'm thinking great boosted method, which is sort of a well-rounded, robust model builder as a first cut here, because it just gives me a good like stock answer right away. I don't have a validation frame, and that's a test string split. I'll talk about that some other time, but that's basically one of the ways that you know you have a decent model. My response column, okay, that's a common terminology here. This is what I'm going to predict on. I'm going to build a model that predicts whether you lived or died. And then I'm going to wish, uh, whip down to the bottom here and hit the go button, ignore all options, and build a model. And the model's done, and I'll take a look. And I have some sort of scoring history as to the error over time as the model builds. And I'm getting a better, better model. And then, you know, I look at variable importances because that tells me what it's predicting on, and it says, hey, if you got a vote, you lived. <laughs> okay, so that's not very helpful if I want to figure out what are the rules are about living and dying before I get on the Titanic, right? So I'm going to try again. So I'm going to blow this mall away and back up here and try again. I'm going to throw out vote. So here I'm going to hit in the ignore columns list vote. And I'm going to go again. there and it's done. Okay, now see the scoring deviance is a little different. It didn't fall in a straight line when it knew exactly what the answer was. It had to do some work. And it says a couple different things. It says, hey, it's important to know where you left port, where you boarded the ship on, or where you were going to, as to whether you lived or died. It seems a little odd. Okay, it, it's important to know what cabin you're in. 
That might make some amount of sense. You can imagine if you were three decks down, you had a hard time getting out. Um, and then sex makes a difference, were you male or female? Oh, and body showed up, what's body? I'll have to go look at the province of the data. I have to go ask, what the hell was in this data? Body is whether or not they found a body for you. So if they found a body, you did not live. But they don't have that for very many people. A lot of people went down with the ship and they don't have a body. Somebody had a question. Yeah. yeah quick question. So what the model are you using a decision tree or? So gradient boosted method. So I'll talk more about individual algorithms later in the course. Gradient boosted method is a variation of the decision tree. So a decision tree uh, uh, splits your, you're building a model, you're building a mathematical function from A to B, where A is you know, your input data and B is your predictor that's going to get, come out, right? That function space is large and complicated. Gradient boosted method says build a decision tree. What does the decision tree do? Well, the decision tree says make a decision on one feature and split the data set into two pieces. Each side split on a different feature and split and split and split and split. When you get under the leaves, you make a prediction. If you get under the leaf of one thing, you make a prediction of one guy and you memorize the data set. So that overfits really massively. It's like a phone book. You just have the answer for this data set, but it does not generalize to any future data. So gradient boosted method says, okay, that was too strong. So don't learn all of it at once, but stop and take like a 10% step toward a perfect answer. I could exactly get the right answer, but take only 10% and leave 90% undone. Then build a second tree that tries to correct the errors of the first tree. And a third corrects the errors of the fourth, and so on and so on, so you get hundreds of trees. Each tree then takes off some amount of the higher order signal in the data. You imagine there's a lot of noise in the data, there's some signal. The first tree is taking off the most signal, the second tree is taking off a little more and a little more. As the higher order signal disappears and gets taken out by the trees, the error that's left over is shrinking, and what's showing out is second order signal effects. And then the third order and fourth order, and the trees begin matching on those. So the sum of all the trees does, a, does in general, a really good job of uh, predicting with not overfitting too much. But if you run it out, ultimately, it will still overfit. Memorize the data. And then if you add a new person, then, you know, if click, click shows up in there, and he says, hey, I'm going to predict on your name. Well, my name's on the data set. He has no prediction quality, so he sucks for me. Right? So you want him to not generalize too heavily, and that's something we'll talk about later. Yeah. Uh, is your platform uh, automatically be tuning your hyperparameter? hyperparameter? So there are a bunch, of, a bunch of defaults. So most of these algorithms have a lot of hyperparameters that you end up tuning, and you have to understand how the algorithm works to know what the meaning of tuning those parameters is and what the usefulness of it is. And it varies by algo to algo. In this case, I'm taking all the faults because they're pretty generic and they're pretty straight up. You have to have some sort of special case going on to know that you need to screw around moving away from the faults. That said, um, there's a grid search option you can grid over the different hyperparameters. This is not gridding over hyperparameters, it's taking my default hyperparameters. Okay. In, in particular, there are 50 trees being built here. I stopped at 50 because that's a good default. Yeah. So one good question. So you don't want your model to be memorizing as much? We'll talk about how to deal with that, but if you memorize, it's like a phone book. You just look up what you know, but as soon as you don't know something, it didn't help you. So it's credit card fraud, and I take you know credit card transactions from all over Stanford campus, and I'm looking at all the data I have, and who who was correct and who you know came back and said no, that was not me. And in the data is like my name and everyone's name, and then overfitting would be an example of just using your name to say credit card transaction worked or not. And then Cliff Click shows up on campus. He's never run a credit card before. That model has no predictive capability because cliff click's not in his list. And for gradient boosting, if your memorization is increasing, while well, your variance of the predictive estimate is decreasing, then right? So right, so that so so, okay, we're kind of getting ahead. Um, it's okay. Um, if you run a test train split, the the training data is is a subset, and the test data is not seen during training. You score the model on the test data at the same time you train. And what you'll see is the training data error keeps dropping, dropping, dropping asymptotically down. But the test data error will flatten out. And that will be the actual predictive quality of the model is what the testing set shows. So we'll, we'll talk about that going forward. All right, so I'm going to come back to this guy. I'm going to remove home destination and cabin and see if I get a, a different set of predictors. Um, in efforts to get a model that I trust better. Here, I'm going to tell name out because I know name is like not going to be good. So here's cabin, here's home destination. Oh, body, body's probably not going to do an answer either. Let's try that one again. So build model, bang, done. What do we got here? Okay, it's not coming down so far. Um, and now it says something different. It's saying sex matters a lot. Women got off the boat, not so much as men. 
And then age and passenger class are getting close to being tied, especially if you include fare and passenger class at the same time. What's fare? How much money you pay for a ticket? More ticket probably meant you were a higher class person. Passenger class was first, second, third class or standard. It's social economic <coughs> status. So, so it mattered as much that you were a rich kid as, as you were a kid, as opposed to anything else. Let me, let me pull up one more thing here. Graded boosted method and the more advanced machine learners all have the interesting problem that they're not very interpretable. Generalized linear modeling makes a much weaker model in general, and it's very interpretable. So the, the usefulness of an interpretable model is it tells you something about why you're predicting um, without necessarily being the best predictor. And so a better predictor might predict on other things. So we'll get rid of boat, body, home desk, we'll see cabin. That's probably good enough. Let's see what happens here if I hit this guy. He's got more options too. It's also very old technology, generalized linear modeling, and it's a very fast one. And it's, it's been around for more than 100 years, and it's super quick. Okay, so here I can say something. Female versus male, uh-oh, I know it, I blew it here. One of, one of the many mistakes you make, I asked for a regression model instead of a classification model. Let me find it here. No, this is H2O running Java under the hood. I have, uh, we'll talk about R and Python here in a few minutes. All right, let's try again, and what do I get? Da, da, da. Okay, so rapidly it converges. It has an AUC curve, it's a little bit less. So it's a 0 0.84. The other models I was getting out, I didn't show you, but they're getting out at like 0 0.9396. They were much more predictive. Okay, so now it says something like this. If you're male, you're negatively correlated to getting survival. And if you're female, you're positively correlated. And that is the main predictor. Then age. So that helps. And then a bunch of other things which uh, have passenger class. I'm sorry, then passenger class, then age. So, so the, the answer there is it mattered a lot who you were. Uh, it mattered mostly whether you're male or female, and then it mattered whether or not you were rich or poor, as opposed to you know women and children first. So my workflow was drop boat, oh, I survived, I had it wrong, I made it to a classification. I built again, I got a less accurate model, I dropped some columns again and again and again until I got something that made sense. And, and out of there comes a story in the data. And that's the story that, the, the notion that there's a story in the data is the key one. This story is less interesting, hopefully, today. Not only has this problem sort of been solved or maritime, but we'd like to think that we're a little more, you know, a little less elitist. Um, although I suspect that, in fact, most people in this room are fairly well off compared to the rest of the country, and that's just the nature of where you're at in college. When you come out of college, you will be in the high percentage of people who earn income in the world. It's just the way it's gonna go. I have a bunch of questions here, and I'm making political statements, so I should, I should stop here. So let me do you first, and I'll come around here. Uh, so why did you draw home desk and cabin for the model? Because I wanted to get a more, a stronger predictive thing. So one of the things going on here is there are a bunch of features that are co-related. And so the predictive power of them is being spread out amongst them. So higher cabins, higher fare paid, passenger class, all relate to the same kind of thing. So if I leave them all in, their effects are distributed amongst them, and they look less important. But taken as a whole, they're actually very important. So I could drop two out of three and keep one and have it as a proxy for the other two. And I get a model that's easier to understand how it works, right? why it's predicting. Because it might equally pick between people who paid more than 200 pounds for a ticket or your first class. And I can't tell, it's harder to tell them apart. This is a simple data set with a very small set of columns. You got a thousand columns, categoricals with hundreds and hundreds of features in them. It's, you can't do it by eyeballing so much. You have to start using your head to say, I'm gonna simplify this model, throw out some things I think are already picked up elsewhere, and see if I can get to the main predictive features out of it and understand why this model works. Why was one orange, one blue? Because it was positive or negative. That's a good question. So generalized linear modeling, uh, fits a best fit hyperplane for the data set. Let me talk about that when I get to GLM here. Okay. okay, so basically here what I'm trying to say is there's a story in this data. There's lots of data out there and there's lots of stories in those data, in that data. Um, I have been talking to people who've been using H2O to do image recognition to find cancer and different kind of you know, sonograms and x-rays. Um, you know, the Netflix prize is all about building a better movie experience, but the generalization is about building a better mousetrap. You know what at and doing with their truck fleet? That's just making it more efficient. Fewer people have to like 
get their 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 uh, you know their repair job rescheduled because the truck was lost in the road, and AT&T can repair can can fix the problems they have in the field cheaper that way. This kind of thing goes on and on and on. That it's all over the world these days. It's wherever you have big data, that there's something interesting in the data. You can pull out. You can get all kinds of cool things that you can go help change the world with. And then the risks here are that machine learning shows you correlation, but not causality. And this is where you have to put your head into it. Why, as opposed to, oh, those two things line up. The machine learning will tell you, oh, these things are correlated. Why? Well, maybe it's just potluck. You go on the internet right now and you Google these you know, stupid correlation things, you find out that you know, Justin Bieber is correlated to the price of ice cream or something silly. Um, and, and so you have to ask the question, is it actually correlated? Is there actually a causality there? Or is it just like you know, potluck? And with that, you know, the goal here is go make a change, a, a story, go make a change in the world. The behavior that you're doing with the data is very similar to programming. It's, it's if you're programming with the data. You're going to be interactive. You're going to have to repeat it. You're going to make mistakes. You have to try again. There's going to be bugs in your data prep and your data steps. And eventually, you'll come up with some sort of script that'll take the raw data and produce an answer out that you can repeat and show this is my steps. The same as you wrote a program, right? You might have over and underfitting issues. You might have to you know, generalize your model before it overfits too bad. You might have to add some feature engineering. You might have all kinds of ETL issues. You know, that's uh, export, transform, load. That's just getting the data in. Um, picking the right algorithm, not all these algorithms will apply equally well to all problem sets. Some are very strong in some domains and weak in others. And some of that's exploration, some of that's, you know, ask people around who does this kind of stuff. But your goal, again, is to get a usable model and a predictive one that you can take out and solve some real world problems. Yeah? It seems to me, uh, the impression that I get of the industry is that a lot of people focus on prediction and not causality back to your previous slide. Do you see any trends in the field right now pushing towards causality, or is it in the opposite direction? <clears throat> um, the first thing that happens is you press the go button and see what you get. And if the answer is 95% accurate and you can't make it fail, then you take it and run. Um, but more often, the answer is it's kind of meh. And then you want to know, how can I go better? To go better, you have to understand what your data is doing and why, and start building features. And that turns into causality. Maybe this was the most predictive feature, whatever that was. Can I do better? Why is it predictive? Right? What's, what's, the call, what's the underlying root cause? OK, as soon as I can figure out the underlying root cause, I can come up with another predictor that's more in tune with the underlying root cause and, and test again and see if that's actually more predictive. So causality will help you build a better model as well. On the flip side, um, uh, uh, if you want to get a loan and you get turned down, the bank has to tell you why you got turned down. That got turned into government regulations saying why. That in turn has been interned by the industry as using generalized linear modeling, logistic regression. And those features, which are positive or negative, red or blue, the scale of them, that turned into a scorecard. And if you passed certain features, you added score up. And if you failed, you went the other way. And if the sum was greater or lesser than some threshold, you got offered credit or not. Basically, logistic regression, which I was just showing the last model, is the same one that's required by the banking industry to hand you a loan because they can explain to you why you didn't get credit. Whereas these other model builders, Brady Boosted Method, Deep Learning, make much better predictions in general. And so new, you know, just this last couple of years, you see non-banking entities will loan you money, but they'll sell you upfront, I am not a bank. Because they're not a bank, they don't tell you why they deny credit. And they don't have to use logistic regression to define who gets credit and who doesn't. So they are using these better models, but they're not necessarily telling you or looking at the model to figure out what's causality, why. They're just saying, I ran my model, I got a 95% accurate one, I'm running with it, logistic regression's giving me 85%, I'm much better off with this deep learning thing, I have no clue why it said no to credit for you, but too bad. Right. So, so that's, that there, is, there is both these things. I think the real answer here is that the machine learning field is sort of exploding right now, and there's more and more and more people piling in, and so all things are growing, including people who are desperately interested in why, and people who are just like, I don't care why, I got my magical oracle, it said what it said, and I'm running with it. Is that something you would use to explain the difference between statistics and machine learning? Because I'm still a little bit confused on that. Okay, so, so I would claim statistics is a broad study of a field of a particular branch of mathematics, and machine learning is practical applications. And the goal here is practical applications. <coughs>
Can you go back to the slide? Uh, slide. No, I cannot. Yes. Okay. In this, uh, do you find that in the industry right now, ETL is a what is the hardest problem? That Eighty percent of your time we spend on ETL. Cool. <laughs> then you still believe I? Is I I've been told that over and over and over again. I watch people screw around. Yes. Is H two O like way way better in this ETL perspective? So so. Um, Yes and no, it depends on what, what direction you're coming from, right? So as the data gets bigger and bigger, and I'll talk about in a minute, more and more tools just fail. Mm -hmm. And yet, on the really big data, you get to search for long tail distributions or highly unbalanced data sets. Like, most people who use a credit card are not being fraudulent. It's only one in a thousand, or one in 10,000 are fraudulent. So to get an interesting count of people who are cheaters, mm -hmm. you have to have a lot of data, right? And now the question becomes, how does my tool handle it when I have a million rows? How about a billion rows? How about a trillion rows? And the answer is tools start falling down at these different scales and you can't actually do anything with that data. So, so people are excited about doing something with big data and H2O in that respect is very, very good. The next thing that happens with the data is you do a lot of feature engineering for which we have these R and Python wrappers. And I'll talk about that. When, let, me, let me go forward here and I'll, I'll come to that. Let me touch briefly on some of the ML algorithms. There are lots. Machine learning as a as a algorithmic study has been around for quite a while, um, although it's only in the last several years it's really sort of taken off as a as this branch onto itself. Um, but generalized linear modeling is like 100 years old. It, this was done on you know slide rules and pencil and paper forever and a day. Um, and, and this general notion is you're going to build a best flip hyperplane on an n-dimensional space. I got 14 columns. I'm going to throw one out for my my predictor. I got 13 columns. Uh, I'm going to do a best flip hyperplane on 13 dimensions. I threw out name, boat, and body, and maybe something else. I may have 10 or 12 dimensions. But maybe I have 1,000 columns. I'm going to do a 1,000 fold hyperplane fit. Um, it's very fast to build. Uh, you'll, you'll find some of the tools are slower or faster. Most are reasonably quick. H2O is sort of easily the fastest on this tool set, on this particular model building. And so you can do terabyte sized data in just a minute or two. So it's just like amazingly fast. That said, the, the built in restrictions on how the model is built limit its predictive power. It's both easy to understand what it does and not so good at it, right? So, so the answer is you take each column, turn it into some kind of a number somehow, scale it by a fraction, and add them up. For logistic regression, you push it to a logit function, which is an exponential thing, and so bigger numbers push it toward the one asymptotically, and smaller numbers push it toward the zero asymptotically, and that gives you this nice S-curve that you're way out here on the one or way down there on the zero on the predictive thing, um, but still, you know, the, the quality of the, of the model to get out is generally lower. Nonetheless, it's fast, it's cheap, it's easy to understand. It's one of the first tools I'll use for every time as a baseline. Bam, it's done. And I'll grab a GBM because GBM is robust. So GBM and the tree builders in general, Random Force is the other good tree builder model, um, use uh, a, a collection of decision trees. And the decision trees do this discrete refinement of the function space. Uh, drilling down until they get smaller and smaller sets until they get, you know, through a series of tests they've discovered just the people who were first class, just the kids who were under age 12, just the whatever, and these people all lived or died as a set, and then you get a prediction on this is little little set of the world. Um, that's overfitting if you use one tree. It's well understood that decision trees have this problem. So then you you make it generalize by, by weakening the trees and adding lots of them. In random forest, you weaken the trees by having them each tree train on a subset of the data, a random subset, and a random subset of the features. Typically, square root of the count of features. So three or four features are the only ones you're allowed to build for each split in the tree at any given point. And that forces you to use features you wouldn't otherwise use and forces you to accept that you can't predict using these other features uh, unless they show up differently in the random set. So random forest has a way to avoid overfitting, and it's actually really good at it. Because of the randomness involved, it, it almost cannot overfit. Um, however, it will come up to a certain level of quality in its prediction, and adding more trees will not help, help it fit any better. Um, and so it's an ensemble of weak trees. Gradient boosted method uh, prevents overfitting by taking each tree and, and scaling back how well it corrects errors by 90% or more. And you can make it go weaker on that or stronger. <laughs> And if you go too strong, you'll overfit massively pretty quickly, although you might only need a handful of trees to get some kind of a model out. Um, and so, so there's different hyperparameters that you'll have to tune on these guys to decide what to do. The defaults that come in H2O, and most of these things have defaults that are pretty sane, because it's reasonable. Deep learning or neural nets is a very different kind of model. This is uh, built sort of 
very, very loosely based on the concept of a human neuron where there's some threshold and if you apply signal high enough to a threshold, uh, that neuron fires and says yes, and otherwise it says no. And then you tweak the thresholds in a 2D grid of neurons, and maybe they're stacked layers and layers and layers. And the deep part is having more layers. Um, deep learning is very slow to build a model, and it's very floating point heavy. And therefore, it's good on GPUs, and you see a lot of deep learning packages run on GPUs. Um, and it's, if it converges at all, it will often be the most predictive model you'll get. So it's slower to build. It's completely opaque as to how the hell it's predicting. It can do a very good job of predicting if you get it to fit at all, and, and therefore it's worth experimenting with if you're trying to sort of you know edge out that next little piece of it. I mentioned only these sort of three classes of algorithms, but there's you know dozens and dozens more uh, targeting different kind of domains. So I have a little discussion on some of the tools that are out there. R as a programming language tool um, is sort of the oldest. It was built in like the 90s. Um, it's very data science friendly. It was built by statisticians for statisticians, and therefore it's very quirky as a language. It's very bizarre if you had some formal CS theory at all. Um, it's very slow, it's very memory hoggy. It has, however, a very active user community in the data science and just general stats and machine learning uh, domains. You can get lots of online help. It has a very complete set of packages for doing all kinds of data munging and, and uh, statistics exploration for which if you're not a stats expert already, many of them just won't make any sense to you. Uh, but it has basic packages for doing everything I've just mentioned on the prior slides. Deep learning, graded boosted method, GLM, all those kind of, it's all available in R. And um, it will run easily on a laptop for data sets of the size I just showed you. But because of the memory hog issues, data sets on the order of uh, you know, a million rows probably will have trouble on a laptop. This will be a 64-bit version of R running on a 16 gig laptop will probably camp out, you know, top out about, you know, somewhere between 100,000 and a million rows of data. You'll just, it won't work anymore. Python is much newer. It's much more CS friendly. The language is actually pretty easy to understand, read and write. Um, it's much faster than R and uses much less memory. It has a number of interesting uh, tools for doing machine learning, but they're not so well integrated or played together as R. So Pandas, Scikit, NumPy are the three big ones. And they, they play together, kind of, sort of, kind of, and you end up doing a lot of ETL issues moving from one package to another because one package will do one problem, another one will do a different one, and you want to bounce back and forth, and you end up screwing around a bunch to make that work. For instance, uh, uh, I think uh, NumPy doesn't understand categoricals at all, and so you have to do all the string mapping to a number yourself and back and forth. Whereas Pandas doesn't have any sort of matrix math capability in it at all, and so things you might be doing with large matrices don't make sense in pandas and you have an ETL issue back and forth, fine. Um, H2O is much faster and much less memory than either of those two. Um, in addition, it will scale out. So much less memory is on the order of 10x or less, much less. So you can handle data sets of like 10x bigger. So I said a million rows, I'd probably kill R here. That's probably a few megabytes. But I can easily do several gigabytes on my laptop here. It's a 12 gig laptop. I can load in an eight gigabyte on this data set and have it do something useful. So, so it's, it's a substantially less memory. Uh, and because you can scale out and add more nodes in a cluster, it'll go uh, much faster on big data than these other tools which are all limited to one node, and many times are limited to one core in one node. Um, it, we have a very nice plug and play interface with R and Python, and you saw the web interface. So the web interface has limits on how you do munging, but the R and Python ones let you code in R and Python, but the data is kept in the cluster. So you can actually do work in R and Python with the data local on the machine for small data and get your workflow right. And then go back to the big data and put it in H2O as a cluster and do the same workflow and have it be run on the big data. The other major player in the sort of free tool space here is Spark and MLlib and Hadoop. Um, they're, they're Spark and MLlib, they're definitely faster than R, but more like Python in terms of speed. They're definitely much slower. They will scale out nicely and you can handle very large data sets again. Although, because of the speed issues, the larger sets will take longer. Um, H2O is really focused on doing machine learning, whereas Spark and MLlib are really a general purpose programming language. You can do all kinds of, of data munging ETL things uh, sort of directly in Scala in that case, as opposed to Python as a programming language. <coughs> Setting up a Spark cluster is actually fairly difficult. If you want to do a one-off on your laptop, it's not too hard. They have a plug and play, set up and go. If you want to actually build a cluster because your data won't fit on one node, um, it's, it's, it's a pain in the butt. Um, the algorithms in MLlib are not as strong as H2O's. They are 
often written, uh, no offense to most of the audience here, they're often written by grad students for their PhD theses. <laughs> you know, Databricks, the company, is busily trying to correct that, but they don't necessarily have all the bells and whistles you want, and they're not necessarily as robust as you want, and so they will often break on new data sets or corner cases that they didn't think through very well because it wasn't necessary to get a re you know, research work done. And then lastly, Hadoop clusters often pre-exist. And this is a real world concern. It has nothing to do with these tools. You walk into a company to go do solving their data science problem with some machine learning, their data is probably on Hadoop. You have to ETL in and out of Hadoop, which H2O does, but Spark lives on top of Hadoop. It's directly connected. So, so you sort of end up, sort of by default, looking at a Spark implementation sitting on Hadoop as a first cut as you walk in the door. And then you have to decide if you want to change tool chains or not. But you're not going to move that data off Hadoop. It's too big to move and, and too hard to deal with, and that's just where it's going to be. Okay, so I'm going to do a little history here, and we'll wrap up. And my voice is running out, so I better wrap up. Um, so, you know, look back 20 years, disks got cheap. And they're on that, that exponential decay curve of price per terabyte there. Um, and they remain cheaper and getting cheaper. And sometime later, you know, Dave Patterson said, hey, RAID, and disk management gets really cheap. And you can have, you know, a crap ton of disks all in a row and make one unified file system out of it without thinking about how to moving files across. Prior to that, you had a file on one disk or another disk, but not spanning multiples. And so if the file got bigger than one disk, you were just, you know, SOL. Um, and then, you know, the next thing happened was people have been using Oracle databases since the dawn of time. But Oracle charges a crap ton of money for their stuff. And so it's you know dollars per gigabyte instead of pennies per terabyte, and so you know it, at a thousand x the cost, you don't put all your data in Oracle. It's too expensive. So you take your junk data, your crap data that you don't care about, and you threw it somewhere free. It was in these Hadoop cheap disks, RAID, whatever. You got it somewhere cheap, and this went on for years and years. And after a while, people noticed they had a whole lot of big data saved on these cheap disks, but it was dead on disk. No one bothered to look at it, no one had any use case for it, no reason to save it, why are we even holding on to it? And people were beginning to debate whether they should throw out their Hadoop cluster because it wasn't any point in saving this data, although it was cheap enough to save it. And then the Netflix prize happened. And everyone said, oh my god, there's gold in their desks. We just gotta figure out how to find it. So terabytes and you know, Google, petabytes and beyond are stuck on disks. Can you pull some signal out of that noise and use that to drive something better in the world, you know, better use case for how the world works. So there's a sun rush to go mine this data, and data science and machine learning are sort of the new gold rush right now, and you know, the race is on to find the better, the better way to, to pull stuff out here. However, the challenges are that the data is big. Your basic ETL is just painful. It's really nice to say, hey, go download this 100K file I just told you about. It's all reasonable to say, go download this 10 meg file, but it takes a little while. If I hand you a gigabyte file, download starts to suck. If I hand you a 100 gig file, you don't want to download it. And a flash stick is starting to get really painful. If I hand you a terabyte file, I'm walking in with a physical disk, right? So, so as the data gets bigger and bigger, ETL becomes more and more painful. And it just won't load on a single machine. And people have been doing subsampling for years and years, but in these long tail distributions, these issues where the, the case you're looking for is way out on the exponential distribution, it's the one in a thousand fraud, it's the one in a thousand cancer then you just can't sample without losing the good stuff. And you get in all kind of funny, weird subsampling, stratified sampling games that everyone's very suspicious that the model they got is actually being predictive or they're just making up numbers. And the old tools just begin to fall over here. Um, like I said, R was probably good for you know, you know, a megabyte to 10 megs from a file on disk. Python might be 10 megs to 100 megs on disk. H2O for this guy will go to gigabytes on disk, but not terabytes, right? And not 100 gigs, small gigs. Okay, the data is also moving. Maybe it's streaming stock tickers, or it's credit card swipes all over the nation. You, you know, how many credit card swipes happen per second around this country? A lot. And you want to do something with that data as it's fire hosing through your system. Um, the data is often irregular and malformed because it was always the junk data that no one cared about. It didn't get cleaned up when somebody saved it. They just took a log file, wrote it to disk, and they wrote, and they wrote, and they wrote, and their log files were the hell the programmer said, I'm going to print my log file. And five years later, you're like, oh my god, here's all, my, here's all the data I have for running these systems forever. It's my network intrusion data mine. If I can figure out how to mine these log files on Stanford, you know, SunNet, things I can probably figure out a really cool data intrusion, network intrusion, sorry, network intrusion model, but I have to go mine to these very irregular, screwed up log files as part of the ETL challenge. But there's a lot of use cases. I'm going to list just a handful. You know, the images, not cats on the internet, but x-rays and sonograms looking for cancer. I have talked to people doing that, right? Heart disease. 
strokes and seizures are all things that you end up with the images for, that you want to like mine the images for learning how to recognize this. So the next time you walk into a hospital room, some guy can sweep a sonogram over your heart and right away know that you're looking at some sort of heart issue without having to get a doctor in there, right? You just want to have the, the model pop up right away and say, hey, this is it. Maybe you got sent home from a hospital too soon. It's expensive to be in a hospital. You don't want to be there. They don't want you there. Go home because you're better. Well, maybe you're not better. And if you go home too soon, you end up going right back. How about we take all the Fitbits on the planet and unify all that data and start doing machine learning modeling on those? Can we then have that Fitbit tell you that, hey, based on your exercise profile, dude, you're going to have you know, high cholesterol and heart attack in 10 years, and you should do something about it right now, right? I talked to credit card companies for which they're losing $100 million annually to fraud on every company. This is not a one-off. This is like, you know, all these companies are looting, losing money to credit card fraud. Recommendation engines, that's like a cool new thing. Now I go to Amazon and people like me like this and I get some recommendations out. Sometimes they're actually useful. Um, there's a lot of uh, ad tech and marketing people have picked up this stuff. Customer churn, All right, is this guy hasn't been on our website in a while, maybe he's gonna go to a competitor, maybe I can hand him a coupon right now. Um, ham, spam on email, network intrusion, uh, internet of things, devices. I'm talking about AT&T and auto failures. Um, General Electric has a million little tiny um, uh, 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 sensors on their big turbines. They go out to some town in Podunk, India, and they drop down a turbine for the town for power, for the whole town, right? That turbine runs silently for months and months and months and picks up a weird vibration. Well, if they wait until it fails, that town's out of power, and then an engineer flies out in a couple days and tears the thing down, looks and sees what failed, then he calls back, they have to custom machine make some stupid part, and fly it out, and they put it back, the town's out for two weeks for power. Instead, if you read that sensor data, you can predict that you got a bearing going bad. And some guy can do planned downtime with the part in hand when he walks into that town and you know, the power's out for 12 hours instead of you know, two weeks. Right? So there's all kinds of use cases for Internet of Things for devices if you're looking for stuff. So your homework, such as it is here, is go get that Titanic passenger list and screw around with it. Download and install on your favorite laptop, you know, Java 1.7 or later, the 64-bit version. H2O for either Python or R, pick your favorite poison here, um, and, and Python or R, and start playing around and see if you can't you know, get an H2O cluster up, connect to it, and do something. The, uh, the website for H2O.ai will have, well, it should be up here, it's not, will have a lot of uh, sort of good starter scenarios to get you up and going and playing around with data. And I'm out of time and I'm out of voice. <laughs> All right. I'll take questions for a little while, but I don't have to run the class. You had a question there? Yeah, I just sure. to ask. Usually we post it on one of <laughs> Okay, so structure of the course is, I, I made this horrible discovery that, that the professors often make up the course as they go along. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I thought as a student, they're like, oh my god, this guy's been planning this thing forever a day. No, I'm a free guy. I'm, I'm in here for having fun. And I'm going to make it up like go. But I'll, I'll I have sort of kind of worked out the topics. Um, this is, it, there is, has to be some sort of, um, uh, of something that we, we grade you, pass or fail on. So towards the end of the semester, I'm going to put out what's called a, a Kaggle challenge, a mini Kaggle challenge, which will be pick some data set and do some machine learning on it and be able to predict the data that I don't show you. Right, so I'll hand you some data, and I'll keep some, and you have to do predictive data that you can't see. And, and, and it's just, a, um, you have to show that you've understood enough that you can build these models and do some machine learning on something interesting, and what the exact details are will be 2BD. Um, it won't be, you know, if you can do anything reasonable, all of you pass. It's a pass fail course. You just do something reasonable, you'll be passed. It's fine. So do you know what those topics Um. I'm still working through them, but I'm going to talk more about individual algorithms and how they work and why. I'm going to go through more classical data science uh, uh, workflows to help people understand what overfitting is and why and how you dodge it, because it's a common fail mode. Um, I'll talk more about H2O and how it works in big data, and that's clustering. And that's our sort of like ops, the data center ops kind of operations. And hopefully we'll get an Amazon account for everybody that you can go ask for a two or four node cluster on Amazon. And you'll pay 50 cents an hour or something like that for your Amazon cluster. Uh, and then we'll have some data sets on S3 that you can suck in that will be much bigger than what you can screw around with on a laptop. Right. Uh, and then I have like I have something for every core, every day figured out, but I'm gonna sort what's going on for a little bit. I'll post something when I have it. The slides I'll I'll talk to Margot about getting online at ICME somehow. 
So somebody in the back had a question. Oh, I was wondering if you could talk briefly about this TensorFlow. Yeah, okay. So TensorFlow just came out. Um, it's, a, it's, another, it's another interesting tool. I haven't studied it hard. Um, it looks to me like it's geared for a different, it's not geared for doing data science at a personal interactive level. It's geared for applying giant data sets on the fly to streaming huge data. Uh, and you know, and their goal is something like, hey, let's go do translate any language to any language at a much higher quality level than you get right now. So they have sort of bigger, higher level goals. The thing that happens with the data science on a sort of day to day basis is that you have to mess with the data. It's programming with data, and you have to have an interactive tool that you can sit down and add, subtract, multiply, and divide, and blah blah blah, whatever stupid thing you're going to do with the data. And and for that, my understanding is is not geared for an interactive experience. And H2O definitely does. And so is R and Python. So that, that's why you need to pick some of these tools up here. Yeah? And so where do you see Bitcoin as this uh, sort of so, so Weka is one of these tools that um, has sort of very well worked out certain kinds of machine learning algorithms and not the rest. So it falls into the camp of uh, you know Python with pandas and, and scipy and numpy sort of. He says it's a very specific kind of ML uh, thing they're doing with it, and it's not got the interactive part figured out. So the ETL is much harder with it. Um, and that said, if you're if you're doing the algorithm that they have, um, it's very competitive with H2O. I, I, I have done, I've looked at WECA in the past and, and sort of neck and neck in terms of quality and stuff. There's some web pages that people do sort of benchmarking these kind of things. But it has this sort of very narrow focus. So if you're not in the one of the things it does, then then you're sort of SOL. Broader, broader tool, at least in the beginning here, you're going to want to have a bunch of options. And then going down the road, if you end up in a spot where WEC is sort of spot on with what you're looking at, you know, yeah, take a look. What is this one? The memory Shit, out of luck. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So in terms of the memory, others, like, I would go grab, I would go look up WECA's memory consumption. My understanding is they're doing streaming stuff. So, so one pass streaming, which gives you a poor quality model, um, in exchange for not having an, a, a memory consumption, and you're disbound. So what H2O does is suck everything into RAM, and you, you take, pay the disk cost once, and you go over it over and over and over again in RAM. That lets you run on higher quality models because you get hundreds of passes of the data instead of one. Uh, in exchange, you're limited by the amount of RAM you have for the size of the data involved. Okay, good class, people. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.